Greetings, sports marketeers. Welcome back to the ongoing lecture series for Sports Marketing Mark 4480. Dr. Williams here, and I'll be your tour guide. Uh, for the life of me, I do not know why this font keeps getting changed when I convert it uh, to Collaborate, but uh, Collaborate has a bunch of hiccups, and that's just one of them. But anyway, Chapter 6 discusses the sports product, right? So, as we know from principles of marketing and this course as well, that we define a product as the value a buyer receives in exchange with the seller. They make an exchange, and that's the value they receive. So, this view, of course, means that a product is more than just a, a single tangible good, it's a bundle of things. With respect, to the, with respect to sports, we have a tangible product, an intangible service, a digital experience, personalities, and live experience. These are not all, all the uh, components of the bundle, but these are the five uh, that we're going to talk about in this course, uh, this semester. So, a tangible product, we all know it's, it's things you can, those are things you can touch, feel, uh, see, things like that. And with sports, uh, products, you know, tangible products include licensed merchandise, you know, huggers, hoodies, uh, pom-poms, whatever, sports venues, like Falcons play and Mercedes-Benz Stadium, as do the Saints, this year at least. Uh, physical spaces where they're played. The company might sell only a single product, or may have multiple products that are extensions of the core products, right? Uh, There's sporting goods in here, uh, as an example. Those are examples of a tangible product. Let's take a look at this. Uh, if you're a sports fan, or not even, or maybe not even a sports fan, uh, you may know this as what the common people refer to as Jerry World. But it's really known as AT&T Stadium, where the Cowboys play, who call themselves America's team, which, of course, I disagree with. And they just came up with that on their own. We're going to call that puffery. Uh, that would be uh, an example of a sports venue, which would be part of the tangibility of a Dallas Cowboys football game. Now, intangible services or intangibility, those are things that uh, typically can't be observed prior to consumption, right? So they are things you can't touch and feel and smell before you get there. And, uh, you know, spectator sports, like in that previous example of Jerry World, that would be football, but they play other things there as well, are often positioned as entertainment, which is also an intangible service. Sponsorships, that's another service. There's typically no tangible product bought by a sponsor. They may include some things in there. But the sponsor, the sponsor receives intangible benefits because they're associating themselves uh, with the sports property. Right? So, and these two levels of sports consumption that we have here, a transactional relationship and emotional engagement, we've talked about before, uh, is the reason that you know, in pre-pandemic pandemic days, you know, they would sell out williams Bryce Stadium in Columbia, South Carolina, which is not a great city to even visit. And South Gamecocks are not a great football team. But, right, there's an emotional engagement that keeps bringing people back. So there's the intangibility part of uh, the sports bundle. 
that sponsors oftentimes will uh, create what they call activation programs. So you can see Coca-Cola, this example of Coca-Cola and Coke Zero uh, sponsoring Bobby Labonte and actually sponsor Coca-Cola uh, sponsors NASCAR at another level, but presenting sponsor or whatever, they sponsor the whole thing. So they include those cues of their logo in there to, to activate you thinking that uh, Coca-Cola is associating itself uh, with NASCAR. Or think of uh, SunTrust Park, which is now Truist Park from one bank uh, to another. But so if you get signage rights, uh, it enables, let's say Truist, for example, to add tangibility uh, to their sponsorships, which are by nature intangible. So the live event or the experience, that's the primary product. Why? Well, because if it's not there, then, you know, the properties would cease to exist. That's why I, would, I call it in the first block, the heart of service delivery, right? Without the game or the event, uh, it doesn't exist. And you branding key events within the experience, sports property break out some events to uh, promote separately think of the NHL what do you think of any sport really uh, you know, the NHL has the all-star game as do other sports the winter classic that they play outside on real ice in a cold place like it used to be played Stanley Cup playoffs baseball uh, you know in the fall enters into uh, league championship series and then you know up to the world series they brand all those separately and uh, sponsorships can use live events and experiences like I mentioned the SEC championship here you know and all around uh, the SEC championship they have uh, you know fan fest and you know Dr. Pepper sponsors the you know throwing of the footballs to yeah, it's Dr. Pepper, you know, to gain um, uh, college scholarships. and So you have the regular regular games and you have the, the special in-season in season events that are most of the time marketed separately. In fact, maybe all the time. Back before there was radio, you had to go see a baseball game in person. Our people would report it on a wire, right? And you could read about it after the fact. And then when there was radio, with the invention of radio, people calling games, you know, you could listen to the the, the game live. And then, of course, there was TV, which really upset the apple cart because now you could, you didn't have to go to a game, you could watch it if you had a television. Digital experience products are having as big an impact as television did back in the day, and maybe even bigger. Uh, so three types of digital experience, of course, game broadcasts, right, which you can see on your free broadcast channels. Uh, you can subscribe to the SEC network, uh, the Longhorn Network, uh, Notre Dame has their own deal with NBC, uh, Hulu has sports, YouTube has sports, uh, smartphone apps, which uh, have, uh, of course, you can watch games on your phone now through your cable provider. You have access to Fox Sports South and Fox Sports One. And, um, and of course, apps to do other things as well, including football pick'em on CBS Sports or fantasy sports. And then, of course, we got internet content. Uh, you know, some of it's for entertainment, news, games, 
you know, they have really changed how sports fans consume sports. If you go back to an earlier reading I signed about, it starts with the University of Alabama college football team. Uh, they just finished their stadium remodel, and, uh, you know, they didn't expand it. They shrunk it a little bit because uh, there's just so much competition for how you can consume a University of Alabama football game or a Georgia football game or even a Falcons football game or a Jets football game if you want to put yourself through that. And who, do, who wants to do that? Smartphone apps, right? Uh, they offer value. Uh, you know, fantasy football is huge. Look at the number of people that play fantasy football. Uh, and it just is unlimited options for uh, creating sports-related content. I mean, people are coming up with them all the time, regardless of where you are. Uh, back in the day, even in my lifetime, uh, uh, you would, at toward the end of a game, if it was uh, if you're a football game at Clemson or wherever I may have been, uh, Legion Field for Alabama, then uh, toward the end of a the game, they would start putting up score updates from around the league and everybody's eyes would turn you know to the board which wasn't very good but to see what the scores were and it was kind of a joint thing everybody you know get excited when somebody ahead of you was you know losing or whatever now that's just automatic in fact if you have been watching ted lasso on apple plus the uh season finale uh, for season one, um, kind of spells that out when everyone's cell phones start going off with the Crystal Palace score, who they were hoping to lose by, hoping to win by six or more. But uh, anyway, a big disruptor and a large uh, impact. Personalities. Sports has a lot of personalities. Players. Coaches, executives, broadcasters, and others. Of course, one of the drawbacks are, let me just say, two risks that are involved with uh, personalities. Uh, nobody's perfect, right? And Mike Vick might get involved in a dogfighting ring. Or somebody might punch their girlfriend or various other things, right? Uh, and that can have a negative impact on the brand. So that's a risk. The other one is uh, you're uh, the most popular player on your team, you know, gets traded or has to be traded or uh, gets kicked off the team for whatever. Uh, and then they're Potential star power is useless to you as far as marketing uh, from the day they're gone. Unless you, you know, you can sell now throwback jerseys. You know, the I think one of the most popular throwbacks for the Hawks is a Pete Maravich jersey. And he didn't play for the Hawks that long. But uh, Pistol Pete Maravich, by the way, look it up. It is a good looking jersey. So let's look at a couple. Who is this fellow? Well, he's branded uh, here, he's branded here, branded here. These are probably branded because they're awful. It's branded here. The color of the truck is red and it's a Ford truck. Now, Ford is still a... Uh, my presenting or lead sponsor for University of Georgia football. Uh, now it's Kirby Smart riding around in it, and it'll be the next coach as well. But, uh, of course, Mark Rick was, you know, average, averagely successful. And uh, when he was uh, just, when he knew it was the end of the road, he went to Miami, right? So, all of these photos and sponsorships, that's not operative for Georgia anymore. And he didn't even go to Georgia. 
Judge Georgia, so it's hard for him to use. Now, I'm going to give you a tip as we go through life. Um, if you want to, you know, not be made fun of, I mean, seriously, uh, get your pants hemmed and cuffed so they're not just breaking all over the place, you know. These pants are too long. You don't want to look like uh, you bought those off the rack. You know, take them to the dry cleaner and have them where they fit. Uh, tennis shoes with uh, some sort of khaki pants. Uh, never a good look. I don't care who you are. Pleats. Here's what pleats do. They make fat people look fatter. Skinny people look goofy. All right. Put a line through that. No pleats. All right. Uh, and black and khaki. Uh, never a good look either. All right. Black here and tan here. Uh, not a good look. Basically, this is all a goofy looking picture, although I'm sure he's a fine fellow. By all reports, he is. Now, who knows who this is? Well, I used a picture of Rick Patino when he was coaching Louisville uh, because that's when, let's just say, I mentioned before that humans are imperfect. Well, here's one. So you can Google Rick Patino, Louisville, you know, jukebox, whatever, but it's not for the faint of heart. And if you're very sensitive, might not be a story you want to read, but that's kind of how he ended up uh, getting knocked off from a very uh, cush job. Julio Jones, your Atlanta Falcon from the University of Alabama and Foley, Alabama, which is about 30 miles from my hometown. Uh, there have not been really any problems with Julio. He's been has a successful NFL career and hasn't been an issue with him. Probably won't be if there's not one by now. And uh, so that, you know, if you want to associate yourself with Julio, like uh, Vita, Coco, Peach, and Mango, does, you know, it's worked out for him uh, so far. Mark McGuire, a notorious steroid user uh, who lied about it uh, and then tearfully uh, gave in some years later when he was helping to resuscitate baseball by knocking home runs all over the place and baseball didn't seem to care uh, until after it was over. He did the, one of those got milk Commercials, which of course people have memed, and uh, here's an example: got juice. Uh, the milk producers they don't use the got milk with Mark McGuire anymore. Uh, nobody uses Mark McGuire to advertise anything anymore. An example, a classic example uh, of a personality that caused problems. Now. You may not know who this is, but this is Vin Scully. I would listen to Vin Scully provide play-by-play -play of a funeral because he's great. And he was great for a long time. I believe he called uh, Dodgers games for 67 seasons. Now, to be able to do something like that, that public for 67 seasons, uh, you have to really keep your nose clean and be really good at it. He's since retired from doing that, but he has now, as of I think two weeks ago, joined Twitter. And this is the address here, uh, the handle I mean, at the Vince Scully. If you like sports at all and you like really cool stories as told by Vince Scully in his voice, I encourage you to follow at 
the Vin Scully. And this particular picture, he's uh, hyping some kind of gum, it looks like. It's hard to see because it's a black and white picture that I dug up. These two gentlemen, both from Texas, whether you follow sports or not, you probably know that one of them because they're both flamboyant characters. On the left, Jerry Jones owns the Cowboys, which I'm gonna draw a star right here for the Cowboys. And uh, on the right is Mark Cuban, who owns the Dallas Mavericks. Both are uh, very flamboyant and loud, boisterous characters and uh, owners of the teams. And I remember the very few sports teams owners, in fact, none of them, uh, get into sports team ownership because they think it's a good business. They get into it because they've already accumulated millions and billions and they just want to own a team. Uh, so you get that level of character. Some people like the way Jerry operates. Uh, I think most people don't. Some people like the way Mark Cuban operates. Some people don't. Uh, I do. Uh, I don't care for Jerry Jones. I do like Mark Cuban. But uh, using those personalities to, uh, you know, to hype your, hype your product, depending on what you're going for, it could reach the desired result. But there are risks in using personalities, uh, whether players or coaches or broadcasters or owners or just celebrities around the sport. There are risks, is the point. So, the levels of a product. All right, you learned about this and principles of marketing. Hopefully, you remember you remember it. But when you think of, you know, somebody says, "What's your product?" That suggests a you know single dimension concept. It's this. But just to reiterate the point that I've already made in this lecture, it's a bundle of things to a product. Uh, and in this example, Kotler and Armstrong uh, define a product as having three different layers or levels, right? At the center is the core product, which is the benefits provided that people seek out and that's what they want. A little further out, the actual product, those are the characteristics or attributes of the product. And then on the outside, we have an augmented product, right? Things that add value and are loosely related to the core product, but uh, further away than, than you might think. Let's talk about them uh, all the time. So the core product is really the answer to that question, you know, why do consumers use this product? We talked about that, uh, I think, chapter two uh, in this course, and of course in your principles course. So we know from sports, some people use it, view it for entertainment. Some people view it as an escape from you know the other, the rest of their day, the rest of their week. Uh, some people view it are they're great athletes and they like seeing people they're great tennis players they like seeing tennis players who are operating at the highest level some people just go with some vicarious experience of a bunch of people uh, having a good time understanding why people use the product is the key you don't start with the augmented product before you have you know, decided, think you have a good handle on what's at the very center of your offering. So a little further outside, we have, <clears throat> you know, the actual product identif identifiable features. So actual product elements are defined, think of it this way, they're required, you have to have them for the operation and execution of the product. All right, so 
uh, it's vital for delivering the product, but it may not be the motivation for consumption. As we learned back here, there are other reasons. There are lots of reasons. There's just four reasons people purchase sports products. So in this example of a, ba a baseball game, you know, you have to have two teams, a field, they're nine innings long, unless, you know, it's a doubleheader and they shorten it to seven or, or whatever they do. There's some, you know, let's just go with nine innings. You have know, umpires, right, to officiate the thing. And there's some unique features of a baseball game, you know, uh, you know, double switch and seven things stretch and various other things, right? So the actual product is what you what you have to have uh, to deliver. You can't just have two teams out there just running around making up their own rules and and whatever. Uh, and over here we have a sponsorship side, signage, advertising, tickets, hospitality areas, brand associations, things we've come, things we've come to expect. Now outside of the that bullseye target that we had that we showed earlier is the augmented product, right? Not essential for product execution. However, they are used to differentiate a brand, especially for discretionary income or discretionary product like sports, right? You have to have food and water and uh, housing, but you don't have to spend money on sports. Uh, but uh, so therefore it becomes important to differentiate your, your product. So you want your augmented product elements to add value. Right, they don't have value, they're just wasted. Uh, so, but they might attract people who may be less interested in the actual product because uh, they're more, they might be more interested in part of the augmented product than they are the actual benefits that, you know, they're whoever they're going to the game with is looking for. Here's an example. Uh, I love prize fighting, and uh, I always wanted to go to a heavyweight prize fight. So I finally got my opportunity a few years back. I mean, Deontay Wilder from Alabama, uh, because he could, he picked Birmingham's location for a title defense. And, uh, of course, when that happened, uh, you know, I immediately bought tickets, and me and a couple of buddies of mine over there went. Now, but here was the problem. You can see that it was sponsored by Corona, which is a beer brand. Well, it just so happened they used this fight as part of an activation program to advertise that they were making Corona in cans. Previous to this, they only were in bottles. So that was the best way to enjoy it. So Corona sponsored it, which meant that the only beer available at the arena that you see is full of people was Corona and in cans, which meant when you went to get a beer, they had to dig a can out of the ice, open it pour it into a cup because you weren't allowed to take cans of beer into the thing which took forever. Uh, so the lines were backed up all around the place. You couldn't get one unless you wanted to miss the fight. And uh, it's an example of when the augmented product doesn't add to, but takes away. Uh, and it really did take away from the uh, enjoyment of uh, my enjoyment that night, because you just couldn't 
the lines were, you know, I don't know, a hundred people long everywhere you went. It just it was not happening. You know, if you wanted to see the fight. So here's some examples of uh, how an augmented product can add value. Uh, you can see, you know, concessions uh, at, here's a good example. If you go to a, you know, UGA football game, the concessions are terrible. You can get a Chick-fil-A sandwich or a hot dog or a pretzel. None of it's any good. You know, it's just terrible. And you can't buy an adult beverage, and it's just ridiculous. Now, Georgia plays uh, in the uh, Mercedes-Benz Dome. Well, there's tons of restaurants and beverage options, both adult and otherwise. Therefore, uh, whenever I go to a UGA game, I generally stay at the tailgate, watch it on television, where I can eat and drink fellowship. Rather than going over into that thing where everybody's treated like a six-year-old. But if they play in a, another venue somewhere, uh, I typically will go and pay premium prices to go. So you can see that adds quality and uh, variety. When my daughter was little and we would go to a, a game, you know, she was more interested in the dance team and the kiss cam and all that than she was the game itself. But she didn't mind going because she knew all that crap was going to go on. Right? Uh, where people were going to get matched up. It was singles night or whatever. And, uh, you know, or if the, it was a dunk contest or whatever. So she never minded going. And uh, the augmented product was really the draw for her. So you can see how it can add to ticket sales because I wanted to go to the game uh, and she didn't mind going because there was a lot of activities going on. This is a NASCAR race in Charlotte, a food line race. I'm not a NASCAR fan, but it's a good example of the augmented product where uh, Coca-Cola, you know, has put up a stage. So around the event, They've got uh, musical acts and comedians and and that kind of stuff, which is, uh, you know, not the race itself, but a part of the augmented product that, as you can see from here, seems like a lot of people enjoy going to. All right. So that is the end of part one. Uh, part two, we're going to talk about innovation and things related to that. So be on the lookout for part two and uh, I'll see you then.